All right, so, so what we're going to talk about in chapter six is spatial analysis and there's different types of things that we're going to use in terms of what we call spatial analysis. Um, we're going to want to see how data can be retrieved for GIS analysis. You probably, I think you touched on that just a little bit on uh, last week's lab, but this gets a little bit more involved and we'll, we'll be doing a little bit more of that in this lab. Um, so how do you perform certain types of spatial analysis and, and what really does that entail? So uh, we'll take, take a look at that. And um, the types of uh, operations that can be performed on GIS. And remember when we're saying GIS, really there's the two broad models or classifications, raster and vector. So they really do both kind of do the same thing, but they do do it with different types of data types and then differently, different ways. But when you say the word buffer in vector and buffer in vector, it's really the same kind of operation. So we'll, we'll kind of point that out. All right, so one of the big things that I, like I said, the GIS, the heart and soul of it is the analysis concept. So when you're looking at spatial characteristics of data, you can talk about uh, a lot of different things, um, but this concept is what we call spatial analysis. When we're looking at the spatial characteristic and you know, when we have the idea of portraying spatial information on maps, we've been doing that for many, many years, um, relating back to probably the early days of maps. So it definitely predates computers. It was just what you might have called an analog GIS as opposed to a digital type of GIS. So I'm going to, we're going to cite a couple of examples here. Um, so here's some examples of, of historic um, map use for uh, GIS analysis. Okay, so for instance, uh, during the battle uh, for independence, during the American Revolution, the Battle of Yorktown, um, the cartographer for Washington actually was using hinged overlay maps that they had produced to kind of track um, uh, troop movements. And we had the cartographer, it was a French cartographer that was developing this. So they were hinged. In other words, they were fixed together and you could overlay one on the other. And obviously they had to be kind of uh, translucent so you could see one through the other. And this is another big um, site cited example of an early GIS. This was in about 1850s, something like that. Um, the, what was called the, the second report of the Irish Railway Commissioners, they, they uh, established this or contracted to have this done and it showed many layers. This is done in the 1850s. So it shed things such as population, traffic flow, geology, and topography. And this was all superimposed on one base map. Now the concept of a base map is just really the area of where you're working essentially. So when you hear that term, that's just kind of the general or broad classification. But we're putting on top of that, we're saying, okay, we got geology layer and a topography layer and a, a traffic flow and a population. So all of these were kind of shown on a single base map. So that was a pretty landmark kind of thing going on there. So this one is always cited in most GIS texts, if you ever read it, uh, as probably one of, one of the key characteristics of what spatial analysis was about, was about and what it proved. So in the early 18, mid 1800s, there was a cholera epidemic that broke out in London and cholera is a waterborne disease that was not really known um, about, they knew what cholera was, they knew it would take people out, it was, uh, um, bacteria, in, but they didn't know exactly where it came from. Um, so Snow uh, started actually tracking cases of death of either cholera that, that, were, that people were died or that had, had contracted cholera and started kind of mapping this concept. And this occurred in London in 1854. And what he did is he was actually went from door to door in the area of um, where this cholera had, outbreak had happened. So in London, not all of it had, had experienced cholera at all. There were areas of, uh, of population sections within London that did, had, had no cholera deaths or related um, cholera um, uh, symptoms. So what he began to do was really just essentially had a map of the, the area that he was concerned with his base map and he was essentially just putting a pin 
at each location that it, he had found cholera. And what he did was he also mapped locations of water pumps used for source of drinking water. So they understood that cholera came from water, but they didn't know really what it was caused by. Um, so he, he mapped those locations and his, his analysis was able to pinpoint by doing this, um, the location of an infected water pump. So not only did he determine who had been infected with cholera, who had died, but he also obviously determined, well, what, what well did you, get your, um, did you get your water from? And by doing that, he was able to pinpoint the, the, the problem pump. And what happened then was they closed the pump. So it took him a while to do that. So he, he pinpointed the source of outbreak and the closure pump uh, stopped it. Now, it took him a while of uh, soliciting the people in London, the, the mayor and the officials, they didn't want to close it. So they didn't really understand that like this was what was really causing it. So they didn't understand that cause and effect. And what was very interesting in this, when you, I've read a book about this, there's a pretty, I can't remember the name of the book, but there's a book about this thing It's pretty interesting. And um, he sampled uh, pretty far and wide. And there was a couple of cases that you might call outliers of people that also died. And he, he by finding the, he determined like where, where did they get their water? And there was um, uh, an older woman that had lived out kind of in the country and she liked the water from that pump. So she actually had um, servants go in and get water from that. And it actually ended up taking her out. So this was a really landmark study. And this would be an ex early example of map analysis. And so the other thing that's interesting, this is kind of a picture. I don't think this is original picture of Snow's kind of picture, but what you can see on this is you can see the major streets that were affected, the deaths from cholera, and then the pump itself. You can see where the pump was. Now, the interesting thing, there's, there's, there's an other X there. There's a pump, there's a pump, there's a pump, there's a pump. You notice there's a cluster around this. That's what pinpointed it to this pump. But you might ask, well, why didn't these have the same issue. And the thing was that what was brought out in the book that you don't always know about is that um, there were different water companies acting or operating within the, the city of London. So what happened was um, these guys had their influence or where they were actually getting their water from on another area on the river. And this pump happened to be downstream from the sewage treatment plant, essentially. They probably didn't have a lot of treatment, so it was basically just where the sewer emptied. So what was happening, you had your, your effluent from your sewers coming in and then the intake from the pump, and right there, that's where the source of cholera was coming from. So it's a, it's a very interesting case of, of early analysis, and this would be what I would call analog type of analysis. And even before GIS came in, when I was out there working with paper maps, we were doing a lot of this kind of stuff. Not obviously um, uh, cholera outbreaks, but we were taking a lot of paper maps and bringing them together. Okay, so when we talk about spatial analysis, spatial analysis can be used to answer um, many questions, but questions relating to topics such as how many objects are within a certain distance of a particular location um, any of you guys ever gone to the NGS website and you can do what's called a radial search if you're looking for a particular group of uh, control monuments or um, benchmarks, they have what's called a radial search. Anybody ever done that? Yes. So yeah, yeah yes. you, just, you put in like your location where you are lat long and it threw a circle around that and what it does is it goes out and finds all the objects within that. So that's kind of a yeah. proximity right. kind of thing. Comment? Yeah, we were doing that for control surveying to find monuments. Yeah, absolutely. So what you're doing is a spatial analysis um, and that's exactly what it's using. Um, so we use this things for many, many things. Marketing, marketing's a, a big tool where this is used. Um, you know, for instance, if I am a, let's say a McDonald's um, and I wanna put a site in somewhere it's nice to know like how many other fast food restaurants are around me. So if we have a site that we're looking to maybe build one, um, we could do a search to determine how many fast foods and what type of fast food that's surrounding you. So marketing, big on that. Real estate, lots of different things. You may wanna know what type of school district you're in or 
you know, number of sex offenders that live around you, and all kinds of things that the sky's the limit. Uh, planning topics, planners, planners are big users of GIS. And, and in fact, if you go to a, go ahead. Somebody have a question? Okay. Um, planners are big users of GIS and I've had, um, I've had, I know that uh, people that take planning courses and, and, and like I say, a four year master's level, a lot of those courses are gonna be GIS level type courses. Um, so how do you choose the most suitable location? And we can base that on a single criteria or a set of criteria. And we'll, we'll get into that towards the end of this section, but that sometimes referred to as suitability uh, index kind of thing. Um, so the best locations for development, and that might be, well, topography would certainly be one of them. Uh, let's say if you were some kind of industrial, you might have to have a location next to a rail line, um, you know, or a major highway, those kind of things. Uh, make that water, obviously, and sewer and all of that. So we can uh, really weed out what's a good location, what's not a good location. All right, so there's a lot of different types of analysis, but uh, one that's used to find areas or locations that meet a particular criteria. So houses that have sold in the last month, you can do this kind of like on Zillow. There's a lot of these things that are available via that kind of thing. Districts with a democratic representative. Um, you guys have all heard of the concept of gerrymandering, I'm sure. And, um, you know, that's where they kind of determine the area of a representative in your state uh, based on, you know, usually <laughs> it's going to be based on whether Republican or Democrat. And what they can do is they can draw these really convoluted lines around those districts. So essentially what they're doing by doing that is keeping everybody either Democratic or Republican. And both, both parties do this, but it's been a big deal. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've heard about that over the last couple of years. In fact, one of, the, one of those things went up to the Supreme Court just recently. So I can guarantee you, this is all done by GIS types of specialists, that that's all been consulted. Um, so an analysis may only deal with a subset of your GIS data. So here's what, what's an important concept here. I, you have, let's say, a database just full of attributes, but it's just like it's just like having, uh, let's say, a thousand layers on a, on a on a CAD drawing. Well, dealing with a thousand layers on a CAD drawing is really difficult. So, same thing with GIS data. If you're if you're looking through all this data to just trying to find a simple answer, um, you can create what's called a subset of that data and just operate on that subset. So that's one of the first things we're gonna take a look at here. So for instance, uh, we've got all kinds of uh, information about houses that have sold, but we were looking at say maybe that have sold within the last month and a particular zoning. So we're not weeding through or looking through a whole, a whole spreadsheet full of, of houses that have sold in an area. We're looking for particular types of things. We're looking for in the last month, that's one piece of the criteria. And the other thing would be, let's say, zoned residential A. So we can, by writing those um, types of codes into that, we can strip out what we need to look at. Okay. Again, districts that have a democratic representation of the state of Ohio. All right, so those examples, so those things we were just talking about are what we call database query. So what you're actually doing is querying the attribute tables essentially, not so much the spatial data, but you will get a spatial answer. So it's kind of cool the way it works. And uh, you're gonna see some simple database query types of things through this, this week in the lab. So let's take a look at that. So what we do is you, you create conditions that are going to selectively retrieve data from your database. And what it's gonna do is retrieve records. So remember records, are the same thing as what you might call um, rows within your database, okay? So you're going to typically use attributes to do the retrieval. So the conditions are gonna be based on your attributes within it. We'll give you some examples here of how that works, okay? What they typically use, most GISs will use something called structured query language. It's called SQL, or some people refer to that as SQL. So we use that SQL format and we can write a, a set of conditions that'll go out then and pull that information from, the, from your attribute table 
And then it highlights that. And once you have that highlighted, then you can weed out all the other stuff you don't need. And you can actually take the stuff that you have found that meets the condition and write it out as a separate layer. So I don't even ever have to look at all that other junk if I don't want to. So SQL, it's a specific format, pretty, pretty standard in databases. Um, and it's used to find attributes meeting conditions. Um, and it's built into ArcGIS, so it's real easy to use actually. You don't have to do much with it. So SQL will use six relational operators, and then we can also use a couple of Boolean operators to look at this. So we'll take a look at these. So what we're looking at in this picture, this is showing you a example of doing a database query on this attribute table right here that you see. And anything that's highlighted is what met the criteria. And notice it tells you that at the bottom, out of um, 3,500 3, some odd records, it found 177 that meet that criteria. So all of this stuff can then be moved up to one layer essentially. And notice there's two little buttons here, right? That button that's turned on right there is showing all records. And if you hit that button right there, it'll get rid of the ones that aren't part of that. So it's kind of like freezing layers. It'll freeze everything that's not highlighted. And then once you take that stuff, you can take those 177 records and you can write them out to a separate um, layer out here. So you got to have another layer out here that would show up. And if you look at this, you can see, it looks to me like the query would have been find all of the cities that are in the state of Ohio. That's probably what that's looking at. Because notice Ohio is the same common attribute here. So you can see here's the database query and here's the spatial component that links to that, which is, which is really cool. Okay, so the relational operators that we would use, okay, equals, so what you're saying is um, use to find all values that match the query criteria. So for instance, city name is equal to a string called Cincinnati. So when you do this, notice where it says city name, that's the actual name of the attribute. In the top part of the column of the attribute, that's what that would be. And of course, there's your operator. And this is, since it's in quotes, it's telling you that that's a um, string, what they call a string, or we might call it an alpha kind of uh, thing. These things, by the way, are really picky. So if you spell Cincinnati wrong, or if it's case, uh, you put it in uppercase, it won't find it. Uh, even if so much as you probably had a space over here, it might not find it. So this stuff is really pretty, pretty picky. Now the cool thing is uh, ArcGIS, you're gonna use a little, a little dialog box to do this. And when these things will pop up, you just click on them and you click on your operator and then you'll, you'll get a list of the types of um, attributes that are in that. You can go through the list and click it. So you don't actually have to type in anything, which makes it good because if you did have to type, you'd probably make a lot of mistakes and not find, your, not find what you need to find sometimes. So this would return records where attribute city name is exactly equal match uh, character, the, the Cincinnati. And in that database that we were probably looking at in, uh, the little lab exercise we're doing it is probably only going to find one record, but there's certainly other Cincinnati's um, around in the, in the country. So if you had a more extensive database, you might pull up maybe four or five different cities. Okay, not equal used to find all records that do not match particular value. Okay, so city name or city name is not equal to Cincinnati. So if you found one record here, you may find 5,000 here because there's not going to be that many Cincinnati's throughout the country. So it returns all records where the attribute does not match. So the other one we have is called a greater than or greater than or equal to. Um, probably going to use that more with uh, numeric type of inputs or outputs rather. But uh, you know, it doesn't, it is important because these obviously will make differences in what you'll get. Okay, so that can be important distinction, whether you use the greater than or greater than or equal to. But for instance, what we're doing here is we're going to say, uh, there's, a, there's a column, perhaps attribute named pop 2012. You're saying find all occurrences where the population is greater than or equal to 50,000 uh, inhabitants within that. 
Or then of course you can use the less than or less than or equal to. And again, that goes the other direction, okay? So lot area that is equal to or less than 43,560. So I'm basically saying find an acre. Okay, now simple queries can then be combined uh, to per perform what are called compound queries where you're saying I could have this or I could have this. And so you're using an operator that links those two queries together, which is called a Boolean operator. And that gets a little bit more complex, but the Boolean operators are connectors to use your compound queries. You, you guys are familiar with some of these, I'm sure. Um, the AND operator, the OR operator, the NOT operator, or what they call the XOR, which is the exclusive OR. So they all have a, a concept in what they're going to yield for you. And um, you, you've seen these done. A lot of people use this logic. These are what are called sometimes logic statements. Um, a lot of your digital electronics use this. So your chips are using this uh, when they kind of decide things. Computers use this. Um, if you've taken a geometry course, you probably talked about something called a Venn diagram where you have a, an A circle and a B circle and you let them overlap and you're getting certain answers, whether it's an and or not or an XOR kind of answer. So these Boolean operators, uh, the AND corresponds to what we would call an intersection operation, wherein features have to meet both criteria in a query. So what you're saying here, and this is kind of cool, um, you're saying I want the population to be greater than 50,000 and the average income has to be less than 75,000. So if it doesn't meet both of those, it fails that condition. So another way of thinking of this is what they call an intersection, where the two data sets intersect, that's where your answer is. Okay, so that's sometimes, an AND is sometimes referred to as an intersection type of operation. The OR operation corresponds with what we call a union, where you're saying I could have either features in A or features in B, and I'll get, uh, it'll choose A exclusively, it'll choose B exclusively, and it'll choose um, where A and B are both happening simultaneously. And so this is very often referred to as a union type operation. So it's saying I'll take values that are 50,000 or greater in population, or the average income is less than 75,000. So you can have either or, and you can have where that occurs together. And you have the not, so this is a referred to as a negation type operation, where in chosen features um, and the not, um, you're gonna get all of the features of the first criteria, but none of the second, okay? So, and even including um, where the two overlap. So here you're saying areas or find rows or whatever records where the population is greater than or equal to 50,000, but it can't have an income anywhere of, the, of that less than or greater than 30,000. And then you have what's called the exclusive OR. Um, that's called an exclusive type operation. And what that'll do is it'll allow you to get both A and B, but not where they intersect. Okay, so you can get features in A, you can get features in B, but you can't get features where they intersect. So they can't have a commonality, okay? So that's called the exclusive OR. And these guys can be really complex because you could have the A and or B, or so you could say A and B or C or D. So you can have a really convoluted group of these Boolean operators. But if you're gonna do long strings of them, you better be careful. And they kind of work like mathematical operations. Higher level map ap applications happen first, like multiplication and division happen first, and then subtraction and addition happen next. So it kind of works the same way with these guys when you're doing them. Well, well, I guess my point is, you really need to know what you're doing when you're utilizing these Booleans, because they really can, they really can give you a skewed result if you don't know what you're doing with them. So that's really an important concept. So like I said, here we go. The compound queries can give you multiple operations. They're gonna select multiple layers based on an order of operations. So here's, that, here's what I was just talking about. So you're saying I can take population and this or 
city is named Columbus. So notice by putting the parentheses here, I'm saying do this operation first. So find the records in this subset first, and then you can have the records in this subset or the city named Columbus. So it would select cities that meet both population and income requirements, and then it would also select cities that, that are named Columbus. So um, by putting these in here though, you can restrict exactly or, or guarantee how that order of application is going to happen. Okay, so once you have the results of a query, that's your subset of data. And then that layers total records that you don't need, you can get rid of. And what you can do then is write those out. So those selected records can be exported as a separate data set they can then become a, a layer, or you could write them out exclusively and send those like to somebody else or use them in another application. Now, the one thing to understand, <clears throat> excuse me, is when you export this selected records out, the other ones are gone. So it's like you're taking that data and just exporting that out. Anything else that was associated with that that doesn't come with it just isn't there. Okay? So once you have that, then you can do more GIS operations that can be executed on that new data set. Okay. So once data is selected, further analysis. So here's some typical analysis that we would see. Um, and this would not be considered, this is more like a spatial type of analysis sometimes. Buffer is one very simple one, very, very useful, very, very much used a lot. That's kind of what that radial search was we were talking about. Uh, for benchmarks, that's considered a buffer. We have what's called a dissolve operation. We have what's called a spatial query and an overlay. So these are kind of the site suitability. These are kind of the big ones that we're going to look at. And these are the ones you see probably used the most in most GIS analysis. But buffer, dissolve, spatial query, and overlay, we want to, we want to hit those the hardest. Site suitability, that's basically just kind of a combination of using these kind of concepts. So buffer, think of the best way to think of buffer is that it constructs a polygon object around elements uh, of a data layer. Um, your best example in AutoCAD would be um, the offset command essentially. Now buffers will act differently depending on the object type. And also here's, I wanna to start to make a distinction you don't have database query so much. Well, you do, I, I take that back. You can do database query on vector, but database query is more typically done in um, conjunction with vector data. But when we start to talk about these kind of spatial analysis here, buffer is, is equally used in raster analysis as it is in vector analysis, okay? So basically this refers to the area a proximity surrounding one or more object types. I'm going to maybe draw some pictures here, but what, what you have is the, the location of control minus within a specified distance of a site. So we already said that. If you have a point, you have a point location, your location where you're going to be performing your survey, basically a latitude and longitude, you're essentially drawing a, a circle around that and it's finding everything within that site setback distance from a roadway. This could be an example of a buffer. And it can be created using multiple object types, but primarily we think of the lines, points, and polygons if we're dealing with vector. And in raster, it's a little bit different, um, but what it does do is operates on a single data layer, okay? So the vector GIS always will produce what's called a polygon, okay? So this is an example of a buffer that has been constructed around, looks like an interstate highway here. Maybe you see that. And what we're seeing is this kind of purplish thing. This is your actual buffer. So first thing that was done to produce this buffer, you had to isolate this right here. So you may have done a database query on your GIS data to isolate this, this highway and it looks like it's probably interstate 70. That's what I'm, I'm kind of guessing. And then you're saying, okay, what is in a proximity of maybe a hundred miles this way and a hundred miles this way? So you're drawing a buffer around that 
And then this buffer can be used to intersect with like say cities. So you can determine, well, what cities are within 100 miles north or 100 miles south of this? So that's kind of the example. Let's take a look at something here. I'm gonna see if I can get you, I don't know if I can, let's see if I can get this here a minute. I do wanna explain a little bit about buffers real quick, which should make sense. I'm sure you guys are pretty familiar with this, but if I go to this, each object type is going to produce a different type of buffer, so that's kind of important to understand. So if you have, let's say, a point object, what you're going to get around a point object is always a circle. This is kind of hard to draw. That, that would not be the typical buffer, but notice usually that's going to be in the center, so what you would have is the radius all around it. Now, you can have what are called friction buffers, and a friction buffer is saying that it's freer to flow in this direction than it is in this. So in other words, there's more friction in this direction. So that point doesn't necessarily have to be within that, okay? So if you do a line, if you do a line, your buffer, your buffer looks a little different. What it's gonna do is it's gonna throw that around and then it's gonna come in kinda, you know, let me put it over here. So it's kinda like the offset at that point. But then usually what it does to end cap it, it's gonna kind of put a, an arc like this and an arc like this around it, okay? And that's what you were seeing in that other one. And if you look at the buffer that you would place on a polygon, your polygon buffer just basically looks like a bigger polygon that surrounds it, either inside or outside. So your buffer in this case is actually what's happening between these two things. Your buffer here is this total area here, and your buffer here is that. So one thing to understand about this, when you do the buffer, these guys right here are not the only buffer. This thing is excluded from the buffer, okay? But here you got basically everything and everything there, okay? Gotta get the idea on that. And, and vector works exactly the same way, uh, except instead of surrounding it with another graphic, what you're going to get is pixels that surround it. So the pixels are going to go out a certain dis distance on the buffer. And we don't, uh, we don't have any way to really demonstrate that because we're not, we're not dealing with that kind of thing. But, okay, so let me make sure, I want to make sure that we got everything here. Okay, so, um, so you, get, you get points, lines, and polygons, and it operates on a single data layer. And you, you can also have what are called friction buffers. So what, again, you're saying that the, the buffer doesn't just go out the common distance. It, it uh, is free to flow in one direction quicker than in another. Um, so an example of that friction type buffer might be what you think about, like say a chemical spill in an area. Due to soils and groundwater, the chemical that gets down into that ground might flow quicker in one direction than it does in another. So you can apply a friction buffer to kind of model that or determine that. And it used to be at one time, um, GIS vector types really could not do friction buffers very well, while raster types could. But I think recently now, the uh, vector has kind of caught up with that and they can actually do a friction buffer. Okay, so a dissolve operation is where you have polygons. So this operates on polygon layers only. Um, and it allows you to merge polygons that have um, a same feature uh, into a single larger polygon. Now, the one criteria is they would typically have to be touching. But what you can have is databases that join together. So an example might be that you have the state of Ohio and you have little polygons within it which are counties or within a county you might have townships and so if you have each let's say county and you have a database associated with each county this allows us to merge all of those counties into one in other words just get rid of the lines that are associated between them and merge all of that data across in one giant um, database so it's useful when you may need to examine regions with similar properties. So again, you might want to use it in a county where you have municipalities or you have townships and you're interested in looking at some feature across that without looking at each one individually. 
Okay. You dissolve, let's say, individual property lines with the same zoning into one like master zoning for that section. And what this will do is it'll combine overlapping uh, buffer zones into a single polygon. Now, the one thing about dissolve, you can go one way with it, but you can't go the other. So you can dissolve lines, but you can't go the other way. So it's impossible to do an undo when you do a dissolve. So one of the things that's really, really important when you do any kind of work in GIS is you always wanna have your original data secured somewhere or maybe even make copies of it because if you screw up the database by dissolving it, you can't go back, you can't fix it, you can't break it apart into the original counties. Yeah. But this, again, operates on a single data layer. And in, uh, in um, Vector, you're operating on a single data layer, but you're gonna have a secondary output layer that actually shows the buffer. Okay, so it's a little different. So here's an example. We can see that we have um, state of Ohio with counties and we wanna merge those together. So we would use the dissolve operation. So the dissolve would take this with all the separate databases and then do that to it. But we can't go that way, okay? We can only go that way once we dissolve. Okay, so buffers and queries are gonna be two types of things that are used quite often in spatial analysis. So first you're gonna maybe do a single query to isolate, let's say a road, then you're gonna buffer it, and then you're gonna do some kind of spatial query based on the buffer, okay? So again, you're involving only a single layer of data, not multiple layers. We're gonna to get to multiple layers when we talk about overlays. So just right now we're still working on a single layer. So you create a, a buffer around the chemical spill location and then you can se select all records for a highway. Um, you can kind of do a lot of different things within that. So um, many types of GIS analysis allow you to combine multiple features or multiple layers. So again, the big distinction here is that buffers are um, buffers we're looking at here is a is a single layer. So if we want to allow multiple characteristics to look at, then we want to be able to combine multiple features. Okay. So when we do that, this process in GIS where you're performing uh, one layer to create a new layer is, is a process called geoprocessing. And there's a lot of different types of geoprocessing methods that you have out there, but you can use this to get a lot of different answers based on what your query is. So spatial query allows you to select records or objects from one layer based on spatial relationships. So there's two kinds of queries here. This gets a little this gets a little sketchy at first, and it took me a while to kind of get the handle on it. Database query is what we talked about, where you're actually querying the database to get an answer. Okay, so you you select records, and then those records will show you what's going on spatially. With a spatial query what you're doing is you're, space, you're, you're querying the objects themselves, essentially. And then what you're doing is then getting your information back on your database. So it's kind of two different directions. And that's it. At first, it took me a while whether I was doing a spatial query or a database query. But spatial query is where you're actually interacting with the objects. And then those objects are selecting records based on that as opposed to the other way. Okay. So queries based on spatial concepts, such as sex offenders within a certain distance of a school kind of concept. So again, here is, um, here's that good example we had. First, we did a database query to isolate this road. And then we took that feature and we buffered it with this buffer. So we produced, we, we isolated that road, we produced this buffer, and now we're using this buffer as a spatial query to determine all the cities that exist within that buffer, all right? So it was kind of a several step process and you're gonna be doing this in those labs this, this week. So it's pretty cool the way it works, but it, it, there is a difference, okay? So you have to make that distinction and think about that. So when you start to combine data that is uh, associated with more than one layer, um, then this is typically re referred to or termed as an overlay. And um, overlays work equally well with either uh, vector data or uh, what we can think of as the raster data. 
and, and actually you do a lot of overlays on both. So to get answers, um, it's a little bit harder to conceptualize or see. I mean, we can think about taking one map and laying it on top of another and laying it on top of another. That's a, more of the concept of, of uh, vector. But raster is where you're taking one raster and laying it on top of another. So really all you're looking at is a bunch of pixels that might be color coded with another bunch of pixels that are color coded. But overlays work really effectively in raster and they can actually be very quick operations, actually quicker sometimes than the, their vector component or counterpart. So this is a, a frequently used technique to do any kind of spatial analysis. And from this, what you're gonna get is um, usually an output layer. But here's an example, for instance, you may have one layer that contains boundary or parcel information and a second layer that contains information concerning uh, natural gas locations. And when you overlay those, you're gonna be able to determine, well, where do those gas locations occur in parcels or near parcels? And the other thing that's interesting to think about with this, um, if you're looking at this layer that contains parcel information, what type of data type do you think that might be? Point line or polygon? Anybody take a guess? Polygon. Polygon. And the second layer that contains information of natural gas locations, that's probably what? Yeah. Either points or lines. Yeah, either points or lines. So what this technique allows you to do is take two different types of data types and overlay them on top of each other. And these are referred to very often as what we call topological overlays. Um, so there's some differences. But if you take and overlay parcels, and points, your output layer won't be points, your output layer will actually be polygon. Because what you're getting is what's considered a, what's contained in this polygon kind of information. So uh, in this case overlay will determine which properties contain extractable natural gas and where, okay, by doing that. So here's a graphic example of those two things. You have your one layer, looks like we're showing a maybe a roadway, I would say that's probably roadways. And the other layer is probably hydrography, um, water, water boundary kind of stuff. And by overlaying these two, this is definitely line data, and this would probably be polygon data. We're able to get our answer, okay? Now, your answer won't necessarily look like this, okay? Because you're, you're not going to get um, one layer that contains both data types. That's one thing that hopefully was stressed in that first chapter, you can't have points and polygons on the same layer. So in this case, you're gonna be one or the other of this type. But this is an example of a visual, um, what they call a topological overlay. Okay, so polygon can layers can be combined through different GIS layout methods or overlay methods. Now again, I, I, want, I want to emphasize this because the author doesn't. Polygon layers are not the only kind of layers that you can overlay, okay? So you can overlay polygon on point, polygon on line, or line on line, okay? I don't think you can do point on point because it would typically be a meaningless operation. You're not gonna get a lot out of that. Okay, so typical overlay methods include what we would call the intersect, the identity, the symmetrical difference, and the union. Um, and to just kind of put this in perspective, these guys are kind of the graphical equivalent of what we just looked at with the Boolean operators, the AND, OR, NOR, and the XOR. So instead of querying the database, basically what you're doing, this is going to give you an output that's actually a physical thing. Now, the other thing too to understand about this, because again, I think the author is a little lax in this concept, he's talking about polygon layers that are being combined. So if you're taking a polygon layer for layer A and a polygon layer for layer B, your output layer when you do an intersect is gonna be a polygon layer, okay? So you're gonna get polygon in, polygon in, and polygon out, okay? But remember, we can do polygon on point or we can do polygon on line, but specifically what he's talking about here or what we're talking about is just polygon intersections or identity or symmetrical difference or union. So the intersect overlay that retains the features that are common to two layers, 
okay? And an uh, example of that might be where you need to find locations uh, that are found within a buffer and also on an agricultural land use. So you intersect the buffer layer with the agricultural land use layer. And what you get is where those two are common, where they intersect, that's what you're getting. And the identity is where you're retaining features from the first layer that also have features in common with a second layer. Okay, so again, you may have uh, a nearby floodplain and you also want to know what portions of a certain property are in it. So there's some pretty good graphics here, what he's showing here. That, think of this as your input layer A and your input layer B. So when you're overlaying that on top of it, because it's an intersect, the only thing you're going to get is where these two are in common. And so you notice this is your output layer. I mean, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense in the real world of what we're looking at, but that would be your answer or your output layer. And of course, polygon, polygon equals a polygon. So here's the concept of identity. What we're seeing is where it's going to exclude things that, that aren't piece of either one of those. So you're taking again input layer A, input layer B, you're doing an identity thing. And notice this little piece right here, this is common to both, okay? And so it excludes anything that's not in either one of them. That's what we would refer to as an identity. So the symmetrical difference is kind of the inverse. The overlay that retains all features from both layers, except features they have in common. And so you want maybe the potential nesting site along with a local plan development, except where they overlap, because that could be a problem, particularly if it's a, let's say, an endangered species like a peregrine falcon or something. That would be something that would be, uh, you, you wouldn't want to have that going on. And union is combining features from both layers together. And where you have possible development, parcel layer, and a water resource layer. So again, this little picture is pretty good. Symmetrical difference. Notice you're going to get the input layer here and the input layer here, but where they intersect, it gets excluded. Okay, so it gets excluded in these areas right here. And then, of course, union is bringing them both together, A and B, and you can see that's what you get. So those are what they're calling about with those four different types. But again, so I, I do want to stress that not everything is polygon out there, and you can do other types of overlays. You're not limited to polygon on polygon overlay. That's what this is referred to as a polygon on polygon topological overlay. You can have polygon on point. You can have polygon on line. Those are also very common ones, which he doesn't talk about. And we can also do this from a raster standpoint. So we're going to see that how that works here. So raster data can be used really for everything we talked about here in raster. It works the same way. You can perform spatial analysis. You can perform overlays. You can do a database query on raster data. Because each raster cell contains a single value. You have a single value. Uh, two raster layers can be overlaid in different ways. Now you don't have, in raster, everything's a pixel. Essentially it's a point. So you don't have anything like polygons or lines or points. We can kind of construct them. We can bring them together in certain ways, but it's not the same as you have in vector. So it's a lot, it's a lot of a different way of thinking. But when you do the spatial analysis in raster, it's very often referred to as map algebra. Because basically you do end up kind of multiplying one pixel type and times another kind of concept. But what this does is allow me to combine two unique data sets. And when you're saying data sets, remember the picture in raster is actually the data set. There's not going to typically be any associated attribute table with it. Okay. Each pixel has a certain value. So if your one, if your one map is topography, that has elevations and the other map might be, um, I don't know, tree cover. They, they each have their own unique value within them. So one of the things we can talk about when we do map algebra is the concept of doing um, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division between two uh, images. Now, some GISs will actually probably allow you to do maybe three or four images at one time. The typical way of doing it, though, is just two images at a time 
and then you do two more images and then you keep you keep bringing them together and together and together so images very often use what's called a boolean image so what you do is you take and you do a query on the image to salt sample what you want out of it and you get it into a boolean kind of concept where you're, it's either going to be formed with ones or zeros so if you get a one out of it you're saying that's a true or that's a valid piece of information and if it's zero it's false or not valid so an example would be if you have a topographic map and you're looking let's say for sites that maybe have an elevation between 800 and 850 so you could write a query on that image to say i want to find all of the values all the pixels that are between 800 and 850 and if they're if they if you find that then you code that as a one and if you don't find that to be true then it gets coded as a zero so that's what we would call a boolean image and then what you're going to do once you have boolean images of everything then you're going to do your addition subtraction multiplication or division so we're going to kind of look at a couple examples here on how this works so consider, and this is a really, this is out of your book, and it's a really, really simplistic, very simplistic thing. But what he's giving you is, a, it's a good example. It's just only has a four, four, I think four pixels. But they want you to find the best location for a vacation home using certain criteria. So they want to know property that is tree covered, property that is near water, and you're going to create two images based on those two things into booleans. So we got raster A, let's say that is the tree covered raster, okay? So we have, let's say an image out there that shows you trees and not trees, but it's got different values other than ones and zeros. So we go in and we do a query on that raster and we say, all right, if it's forested, I'm gonna set that pixel to one. And if it's not forested, I'm gonna set it to a zero. So you actually take an input layer here it might be called the tree covered layer of, of raster. You're going to write an equation essentially on it that's going to go through that, that image and it's going to find all of the forest, set it to one, what's not for, set it to zero, and it's going to write a new raster out there. So you have an input raster and an output raster. So I'm converting this into a, a Boolean. And the second raster that you have is raster B. And if it's near water, it's a one. And if it's not near water, it's a zero. So what you're doing again, you're taking a map that shows you water courses and land and anything that's essentially near water or water, you might make that one. And if it's not near water, it's a zero. And then you're gonna overlay these two. So what we're seeing here is, this is representing your tree covered layer, okay? So this pixel, that's tree covered, that's tree covered, that's tree covered, and that's not tree covered. And what this one is, this is your near water, not near water. So what this is showing you, this land is near water, that's near water, and this is not. And we're gonna overlay these. Literally, you just think you take this guy and you place him right on top of it. And what you're gonna do is do either a multiplication or a division or something between those two layers. So in this case, um, when you overlay the two images, you're looking for those criteria. So two methods can be employed to combine those. You can either do an AND operation or you can typically do an OR. And they don't kind of talk, they don't call them that typically, but that's kind of what you're doing. So if I go back to this, what I'm saying is an AND operation would say, this pixel has to have a one in this position and a one in this position to be true, okay? If it's an OR operation, it could have a one or a zero. So you're gonna get different results depending on what you do. So if you multiply raster A by raster B, what you're doing is what we typically refer to as, a, as an AND operation. So it has to have both of those. And your output image is gonna contain values of zero or one depending on what's going on. So you're going to get a zero when you multiply a zero by any other value, and you're going to get a one when you multiply a one times a one. If you add the raster is what's going to happen, you're going to get potential values from zero to one and two. Okay, so zero is not suitable at all. 
one is suitable and two is most suitable. And this would be an and or an or. So we're saying I could have either this or this, okay? And the difference is this gives you an explicit absolute answer. It's either this pixel or it's not that pixel. This one is saying, well, it's not that pixel, but I could have that's somewhat suitable, but two is the most suitable. So there's a difference. And when you do raster, you better know what you're doing because a lot of this, you might do, you might do one overlay with a, with a set of data, then another overlay with a set of data, and then you're gonna take those two answers and you're gonna do another overlay between that. You end up with raster, I've done a bit of it, and it, it, it becomes a lot of overlays and keeping track of all, your, all of your output layers and, and what you're doing with them and how you're getting answers, it's, it's, it's really hard. And you don't always, you kind of got to know what your answer is going to be before you get to it. Otherwise, it's, it's, uh, it can get a lot of wrong answers. So again, let's look at this example. This is showing you the AND operation. So we're saying this pixel times that pixel yields a zero. That pixel times that pixel yields a one. This times this zero and that times that one. So this is my input layer A times my input layer B and that gives me um, my output layer. So multiplication, it doesn't matter which one we multiply first, A or B. But if this was division, that would make a difference. So that would also be important. So here's the, the add, additive types of thing. If you take that pixel in that position, plus that pixel in that position on the same, same position on different rasters, we get a one. One plus one is two, and you can see how that works. Now, typically with, with pixels on a, on a raster image, you're talking about maybe hundreds of thousands of pixels. So this output layer happens pretty rapidly when you do it in raster, but it's pretty cool the way it works. But first step, again, we convert that to a Boolean, that one to a Boolean. So that gets converted to a Boolean, that gets converted to a Boolean. Then we do our operation, then we get our answer. Okay, very simplistic. All right. So that preceding overlay analysis, we were just trying to determine which locations are best for meeting certain criteria. And we had only two, but you can do a lot. So if you have like a, a lot of criteria that you're after, you can do what's called a site suitability. So, um, and I can weed out uh, what's not suitable at all. Or, and I can also look at the most suitable and I can base it on more than one criteria. Now, again, Site suitability, he's kind of talking about in this, in this section, what he's kind of talking about is allowing you to do it kind of all in one shot. A lot of GISs don't let you do that. So for site suitability on something we were just looking at here, if you have multiple criteria, you may have to do these two overlays first to get that answer. And then you have another group of, of uh, layers that you're gonna do with other criteria to get an answer. And then you're gonna overlay these two answers together. And you can keep doing that and keep doing that. But I think what your author's indicating here is that what you can do is kind of do it in one shot. But of course, this is gonna be used for many applications, primarily the land business, land development, there's a lot of that, or planning purposes, those kind of things are very important. Um, and in this case, if you have a lot of criteria, so you have a lot of overlays, a multiplication will eat a, yield you either a zero, not suitable, or one suitable. Um, addition is going to give you a ranking scheme, okay, especially if you're using multiple layers. And typically, the higher the number, the more suitable or the more it meets your criteria. Okay, there's many criteria that can come into play in choice uh, su suitability, like determination of best or worst location may not be the only solution, okay. You might want to consider other criteria you know, outside of initial condition uh, to get a final answer. Okay, uh, and in order to arrive at your best solution, you may have to have to do a distance calculation as well. So we're going to take a look at what we mean by distance. Distance, you can think of as kind of a buffer, but it's kind of a buffer that doesn't have an end. So when we think of a buffer, a buffer is going to have a, a limited location. You know, if we're looking at um, like that roadway example where we said, okay, we're looking at 100 miles north and 100 miles south. That buffer is only gonna go that far and it's not gonna extend past that.
but a distance location is going to continue to calculate it until it gets to the end of the map or the end of the data. And what it does, it, does, it just fills in the values of that. Um, so it just calculates the distance from one point to all other points within that. And that's either true with a vector, which you might think of, it would kind of be like a contour map of the distance away from your selected object. Or in terms of vector, what you get is pixels with each pixel filled in with the value. I'll try to show you an example of that. So for instance, the distance uh, site location is from a wastewater treatment plant. So we can just isolate, in other words, we can isolate the location of our wastewater treatment plant, and then we can run a distance operation and it just goes out and it calculates, like I said, you can think of it as being uh, contours that just kind of float away from that. And uh, then you can calculate the distance of location from all other features. So you can merge these things, which is kind of cool. So distance, uh, your vacation home is to a river access. So the best way to think of distance is to conceptualize a continuous surface, such as a topographic surface. That's kind of why I use the concept of um, a, a, a contour line, okay? So if we go, let's look at that real quick. Let's go back over here. So if I get rid of this real quick, let me uh, start a new image here. So if we have an isolated feature here, so if I have a feature that's isolated, so I can start going out and that might, I'm obviously I'm not drawing it very well, but that might represent a distance between zero and uh, let's say 50, or let's say a mile. And then the next one is two miles and then three miles and then four miles. So what you're getting is, if you think about it from a topographic standpoint, what you're getting is a bowl. And as you get further out, the, the sides of the bowl are getting higher and higher as you go out, okay? Um, so if you had something a little bit more complex, you're going to get that stuff will kind of look like that and it looks different, you know, as you go out. Okay, so I'm not being able to draw that very well. But what it's doing is it's, it's calculating distance and calculating distance. Okay, now with pixels, what you have, um, it calculates, let's say you got pixel squares each pixel square, as I go out from this object, that would have a value of maybe one and then two and then three and then four and then five. So your output layer is gonna have stuff like that. When it goes diagonal, it kind of has to figure out a little bit of a different process because that's not gonna exactly be one. It might be 1.5 and then it kind of goes this way and then it goes this way to get your answer. So it's not exactly as neat or clean as it would be in a vector. So this would be more like what you would see in vector. And this would be kind of my warm what you would see in um, raster. But if you have a raster, if your raster is this big and your objects down here, you're going to get values all the way out to that. And they're going to stop at the edge of that. Okay. So that's kind of what's going on with that. All right. So think of it again, the best way of conceptualizing it is the is a continuous surface, not like a hill, but like the inverse of that, like a like a pole, and it's coming out. Okay. So each spot on that surface is going to be a certain value away, and that distance value is what you're getting. That's your from the selected feature. And the selected feature could be a point, it could be a polygon, it could be something big. So it just depends on what that feature is, okay? So this is a common function in raster GIL uh, analysis as well. And uh, the values then can be arranged as, uh, or reassigned rather. I guess I, what I would say is they're gonna have a distance component to them, but they can be reassigned ranges. So in other words, you can say, that the distance from zero to one mile is a value of one. And then from one mile out to five miles is a value of two. And then from five miles out to 20 miles is a value of three. So that's what we can do by ranging. And this concept is what's known as an isopleth map 
which basically means ISO measurement, essentially ISO measurement, ISO plus. So a topographic map with contour lines, those contour lines are called ISO plus, and that's an ISO plus map actually. So consider this, and this is a good example that your author gives you some really neat pictures actually, that you're mapping locations for a set of Ohio cities, and the cities are points or cells. Uh, if they're points, that would be vector essentially. If they're cells, you're probably talking raster, okay? So we can, we can cross talk about this. So these are what are considered your target feature. So the first thing you do is if you're gonna go out and do a distance calculation, you have to go and do a database query and grab either the points or the pixels that you're going to do a distance on. And then you generate what's called a distance calculation. So it's gonna calculate the distance that each cell is away from the target or each uh, contour is from the target. It creates an output image based on your calculated distances. And then you can convert that into a range that again cor correlates to the value. So you can say, all right, I wanna re reassign anything from zero to 10 as a range one, 10 to 15 is two, like we just color talked about. And on raster, then you can color code those. So range one might be red, range two green, those kind of things, and you get that output image. So here's a good example. This is uh, showing you, this is uh, that concept. I think these are Ohio cities in, in um, uh, the state of Ohio, throughout the state of Ohio. And I'm imagining uh, this is probably up near Cleveland. This would be the Columbus metro area. And this is the Cincinnati, Dayton, Megalopolis, you know, that's going in the ground to each other. So what you're looking at is you first isolate all of the cities and you notice each city gets isolated. So you went out and did a database query and you said, okay, find all the cities in Ohio. Those get highlighted, those become your criteria. And then you run what's called the distance uh, function and the distance just goes out from that city and it just starts generating contours essentially. Same thing here, you can see what's happening. And when they get, when they start to touch each other, then they merge and you can notice um, none of them get too far away until they hit another city, particularly in here. But when you get up in here, this is Cleveland. Of course, this is going into Lake Erie, and I imagine that's Toledo area. And you can notice there's really not land in here, but it's just showing you the distance away. So there are actually a couple of places down here, obviously that's probably West Virginia, um, that are getting pretty far away. So what the colors are representing in this case, it's uh, zero to, that's probably meters, I would guess and then you're going from zero to 12,000 something. And those numbers are probably generated internally in the software, but you may be able to tell it what you want those to actually, in fact, I, I know you can tell it to kind of be what you exactly want. So what is done with this, once you have this image, this data set, then you can rewrite it over into that data set. You can do what's called a range or you can scale it. So what they've done, is you don't really see the scaling here that's done, um, but particularly they might have actually taken these two right here and made them into that green band. Doesn't look like that's what they did. Looks like they just took that and said, I want that to be range one, that range two. But theoretically you could say, I'm merging anything from zero up to 37,000 and I wanna make that one band. And then I wanna go from that range to that range and make that another band. So you kind of get the idea. So you can see they're not really buffers because these guys can continue until they hit the end of the data, all right? So a buffer is only gonna go as big as the buffer distance allows it to go. Okay? Now you can create a buffer out of this. You can do what's called a clip operation. So you could kind of run a buffer around one of these things and determine what's happening within that buffer. So, or you can say, well, I want my buffer to be from let's say zero out to uh, 50 miles. So you can kind of do that, but this is a distance that's going to run that distance out until it hits it. So another type of overlay operation can yield what's called a, a raster representing suitability index. Now again, he's, he's, he's kind of blurring the lines between raster and vector. I mean, he really is, he's really talking raster, but I want you to understand you can do everything you're talking about in raster, you can do in vector and vice versa pretty much. So 
when you talk about a suitability index, it's a way you can rank um, locations based on how well they fit your set of criteria, whatever you're looking for, okay? So you're, let's say, um, you want to be able to determine, let's say, for land for a subdivision, and you've got a lot of different criteria. Topography has to be a certain thing. Uh, proximity to a certain school district. You got to have sewer. You got to have water. Um, you know, the list can go on. So the values will be ordinal. What does what does that mean, ordinal? You guys remember the scale of measurement we talked about that last week? Anybody want to venture a guess? Anybody know the, the, the scale of measurement? I think I heard somebody. Remember the scale of measurement? We had what, nominal, ordinal? What were the other two? Nobody remembers? Nominal, ordinal, interval, ratio. Yes, that's it. So ordinal is the second order. So ordinal is, is an ordered kind of thing, you know, higher order. One, two, three, four. Okay, that's what they're talking about there. So it's going to be an ordinal type of value. And it'll offer a, a wide gradient of choices. So in other words, you're going to come up, you can think of ordinal as a ranking. It's a ranking scheme. You know, the best, actually in this situation, the best might be the highest number and the worst location might be the lower number. Okay, when we're looking at that rank. So it might be a reverse rank to what you're thinking. So consider this where you're using a three input raster image. And you need to understand too that you cannot do three images and all raster GISs. They may not allow you to do that. So the example that he's showing you may not be true for all rasters, okay? But what we wanna do is find the best location for a vacation home. And you wanna use this criteria, distance from busy roads is a main condition. Uh, in other words, you don't necessarily want a, a, to be close to busy roads. Uh, greater distance away is more uh, desirable. Um, in raster one, you're going to have distance to forests, higher numbers are best. Okay, so you, in other words, you want to be in a forest and not away from a forest. Um, raster two, you have distance to rivers. Again, highest numbers are best. So you wanna be closer to rivers um, than far away. And raster three has the criteria of distance to roads. Higher numbers are best saying, you know, you're further away from a busy road. Cause again, we're thinking that this is a vacation home. So here's your, here's your rasters. So what they're doing in this is there's your distances to forest. Remember five is your best. Distance to rivers, five is best in this case, and distance away from roads. So these guys right here, obviously your road is probably over here. Um, so what you're doing is when you're overlaying this, you notice what you're doing is you're adding. So I'm taking three plus five plus five, and I get a 13, and I get three plus four plus five, you get 12, and you can see what's happening. So as you add these up, this is your suitability index. And then you can go, if you had, thousands of pixels on here, you can have the software going and say, okay, find the numbers that are between, let's say 10 and 65. And it would go out and pick all the pixels. And in that case, it would find these guys right here. And those would be your best, your most suitable for your location. These would be the least suitable. And you could write a, that out as a Boolean image where you have all of these then could be converted to ones and all of these could be converted to zeros. We could also do this as overlays that are separate. So we could do this overlay on top of this to get an output image, and then take that output image and overlay it on this one to do that. So again, I do want you to understand a lot of raster GISs would not let you do this in one step. You would have to do it in multiple steps to get that output layer, layer right there, that output answer. Okay, but this is allowing you to do a overlay where we're doing an addition of raster one, raster two, raster three. Uh, the, the software that I'm most familiar with where we were using raster exclusively was called Adresi, and we were not able to do multiple um, overlays. You had to do two at a time. So what that did was created a suitability index, it contains a wide range of options, and then we could look at those and further do analysis. Okay. And in this case, 
what we're looking at is highest numbers are the most suitable. Okay, 13 being obviously the most suitable in that situation. 12 and 10 were okay, possible alternatives, but they're not the best. Seven's mediocre and you would probably weed that out. And then those unacceptable, okay. All right, so you can process uh, numerous large spatial data layers at one at a time, at one time rather, not one at a time. And um, GIS has the ability to handle many spatial factors and combine them together. But again, sometimes you have to do it piecemeal. Okay, so that just depends on the GIS. Um, we were actually able to, in that Adresi program, you could do multiple overlays, but you had to write an equation. Like you said, I would take image A and multiply it by image B plus, and then I want to add image C to the output. And then you could, you could do this in one long string of equation, like you're putting brackets in, like say when you're keying that in on a calculator. And then you could just process this and let it run. The problem is you're not seeing all the intermediate answers. You're just getting your output answer. And again, you really have to know what you're doing if you do that kind of stuff. So this is showing you probably more the concept of vector overlay. But again, it's the same kind of concept, seeing how that works. OK, so a GIS model is just a way of combining spatial dimensions or characteristics. And what you're trying to do is use this for a predictive tool. So you, you want to explain a process, or you want to use it as a predictive tool to get results from. So you know that you're modeling criteria. And you're putting all this in and letting the GIS run and you're getting answers. So climate scientists use this a lot as a predictive tool. So not necessarily GIS, but it's kind of maybe, I'm sure you've heard of that kind of stuff where these guys will go in and, you know, they're putting in what they think is going to be the trends over the next years and um, kind of see like, you know, what's the temperature increase? If this increases by this amount, what will happen to the water vapor? What will happen to this? And, we start to see things like predictions of, of higher amounts of uh, hurricanes happening and rainfall shifting patterns in some areas that so might get drier in some areas and wetter in other areas. That's an example of a model uh, that's very complex and GIS allows it to do very similar things. But it allows you to, the important thing is it allows you to do various criteria and it do it together. And you can do it spatially, and you can kind of see how things happen. So a lot of planners are using this GIS model concept as a predictive tool yeah, used in decision making very, very definitely. Yeah. So let's see, the layers can be weighted for greater effect. So what you're saying is some light layers, layers of data are going to have a greater impact uh, in the end result than um, other layers. And Again, it was kind of the concept of maybe even some would have a frictional concept where they would slow down or impede processes where other ones are going to increase them. So that's kind of what we're doing by weighting them. And then your end result is going to be, again, a ranking scheme. You know, what's the best area? What's the worst? Whatever. If we're looking at, like, say, development, that would be uh, different than, say, uh, climate change kind of thing. So one of the uh, examples of this process is referred to as multi-criteria evaluation or what they call MCE. And what we're doing is you're combining factors and they're weighted and combined. And what this does is gives you a suitability uh, for a site. So we're, again, he's talking primarily site location, but this process can be used for other things, right? But again, used in the decision-making process, which I, I guarantee you lots of large-scale corporations use this kind of stuff daily, depending on you know, what they're doing. Um, this um, group is actually from Purdue University, this land transformation model group. They've developed this uh, process, and you can actually go out to their web page. They uh, have combined, well, it's kind of a study that they've done, and then they use um, various weighted raster layers or data to determine land changes that have, have occurred to urban land use or from, let's say, um, agricultural land use to urban land use over time. And um, then they're predicting what, like, say, future changes are going to look like. And so you can model, like, what, what they think in, let's say, 
what's the economy going to be like? Uh, you know, what's the weather going to be like? Um, how, how's that going to change? Um, I could put all kinds of predictive types of things in there to get answers. And then they generate this thing and let it run. And it kind of shows you how you're going to essentially go from an urbanized lands or a less urbanized landscape to a more urbanized landscape over time. If you guys have a chance, you might want to check this out, this group called the Land Transformation Model, but it'll take you to, basically it's a site on Purdue. And I want to show you, this is, a, this is an example from something that they have done. And this is a really interesting study, but this is showing you um, when they started this, this is real world data that was generated in 1980 when they started this study. And I believe, right, this is, this is Detroit. So this is like St. Clair. Lake St. Clair right here. Uh, that's probably Ann Arbor and some of the surroundings. So this would have been urban is red, you can see, and forested is green, and the rest is agricultural. So pretty pretty much agriculture in that region of, North, of Michigan, lower part of Michigan. So they let it run and they calibrated it again in 1995. So probably started it in 80, checked it in 1995, calibrated it. So if there were any predictions that were seemed to be off, they probably calibrated it to change this. So notice what's happened. It's really interesting as you see, I mean, you, can, you could probably guess what's going on there, but you can see this was essentially the outskirts of greater Detroit area, Ann Arbor. You can see that these guys haven't grown all that much in that time frame, that 15 year time frame. But if we generate it out to 2020, which is interesting, you notice this spread, the spread over here, how it's changing, it's going south, it's tending to go north. These cities are also experiencing spread, Ann Arbor, those are starting to grow out. Notice there's a big band of forest right in here, and you can see it, it's actually still pretty intact at this point. And they're predicting it, projecting that out to 2040, and you can see what's gonna happen to the urbanization. Uh, and they're looking at primarily a loss of uh, agricultural land and also forested land, which is pretty important when you look at that. And I think it's also interesting to note, um, you can see this is one of the major probably interstate corridors right here. If you look at that, you can see there's a little bit developments along that, but you can see how that's expanding. But notice it's really expanded up here. And when we get out to here, how that's almost like one connected city. And these are almost now one connected city. We can see the exact same thing happening between, like, say, the Dayton area and the Cincinnati area. That that 75 corridor is just rapidly expanded in terms of uh, development and how it's basically just almost an interconnected city. And it probably will be, like, say, by 2040. You won't see much. I mean, I remember going up 75 up to Dayton, and you just didn't see much out there. And now it's 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 really grown quite a bit. So this is a this is generated by that land trust group that uh, is from Purdue. So you might want to take a look at those. But, uh, it's kind of interesting. Okay. So that kind of concludes this. Does anybody have any questions? We're going to get to see how some of this works firsthand. Anybody questions on anything? No. No. Okay. So what I'd like you to do is go ahead and read uh, chapter six, and we will be doing that lab out of chapter six. Um, I'm going to get you guys a little homework to do also. I don't know if I'll, I'll probably give it to you guys Thursday that deals a little bit more with vector or raster type stuff because raster is pretty accessible. So there's some, uh, there's some things I want to go over with raster. Um, show you guys how that works. So uh, we'll get that. I don't know if I'll do it this way. I might do it next week. So um, Okay, if there's no questions, I will go ahead and um, stop this for now. Go ahead and read chapter six, and we will be, uh, we'll be uh, working uh, on that next section, okay? And I'll get this, uh, I'll go ahead and get this formatted, and uh, then we'll, uh, I'll have it posted. So hopefully it won't take 